Welcome back, everybody. This is a, a great afternoon. We have a couple good speakers lined up, and it's going to be with, uh, I've got great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, Dr. Antonio Jimenez. Uh, he's the founder and the chief medical officer of the Hope for Cancer Treatment Centers in Mexico, Thailand, and Colombia. For more than 25 years, he has dedicated his life work to the study, clinical search, research, and implementation of non-toxic and integrative strategies to treat cancer, chronic infections, immune disorders, etc. Dr. Jimenez's seven key principles of cancer therapy form the foundation of his comprehensive integrative protocols that include efficacious and tumor selective treatments such as sonophotodynamic therapy, photodynamic therapy plus, and a Sonavera immunotherapy. And without further ado, Tony, would you want to come up and take over? Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, thank you, Nick. And Nick is a good friend. He's actually been to our clinic in Cancun, Mexico, so we go back quite a ways. Um, this is the second conference, in dental conference that I ever speak at. And so I'm really happy to be here. The first one was many years ago. It was when the Cavitat was uh, released uh, by Bob Jones, and that was in Colorado. And we're not that old, but we remember the Cavitat, right? Uh, so this is my second one. I'm happy to be here. Thank you all for uh, sticking around, right, next to last lecture. Uh, I had, early on in my career as an integrative oncology, I had a wow in dentistry. And that really flipped my thinking of how important dental health is. And that's when we had a patient with myasthenia gravis. You know, that's a chronic autoimmune neuromuscular disease. And this patient was highly symptomatic. He started having problems breathing. You know, it paralyzes the muscles, the diaphragm in this case. And his name is John. And I took him to a colleague, a biological dentist in Tijuana, Mexico, and I said, Dr. Kelly, you know, this is a situation here. Let's try. Let's try to do something in the mouth to see what we could do. And Dr. Kelly said, Tony, you have to come with the patient because <laughs> if something happens in this process here, you know, at least you could do something as a doctor. So I was there. And I kid you not, and, you know, you guys live this every day, but as the toxins, the metals were removed, John, the patient, took a deep breath, and from that moment on, he was fine. He was fine. We tracked him for 10 years, and he was cured from myasthenia gravis. We didn't publish that or anything, but it was my, my wow. And um, our first clinic opened in the year 2000 in Tijuana, Mexico, Coho for Cancer uh, Centers. And uh, ever since we opened, all of our patients are referred to a biological dentist, right? So we pay a lot of importance on the dental aspect. And I think a lot of my colleagues in integrative oncology throughout the years have caught on what you know, how important this is. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about dental toxins and integrative oncology. And I'm not a dentist, so <laughs> if there's any uh, mistakes in what I say with respect to fine dental things, just let me know. But um, the first slide, and some of this, of course, you have heard already, and this is not working. Okay, so... So when that site comes up, it's a, it's a Meridian slide, and I just want to read some notes that I prepared. Uh, it, might seem, uh, it might seem strange to say that there are profound links between the state of your gums and your overall health. We are not teeth plus the rest of the body, but a single unified whole. Teeth are connected, as we know, to the rest of the body, not only physically, energetically, and for sure, emotionally. 
So local problems don't stay local. They are truly systemic in all aspects of the word. Research has detected periodontal bacteria in the affected joints of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and near the heart of those with cardiovascular disease. These physical effects, of course, have a significant energetic component. So talking a little bit historically, about 5,000 years ago, the Chinese identified these meridian systems were energy flows, qi. Meridians pass through the body along 14 channels, carrying energy into and affecting every organ and every physiological system. And a physiological system includes the teeth. Centuries later, a former dentist from Germany, Fritz Kramer, mapped out the specific energetic relationships between teeth and organs. And this was truly the development of what now we call biological dentistry. Uh, with respect to studies, there was a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 1998, and using functional magnetic resonance imaging, it showed that stimulating an acupuncture point in the toe activated the exact areas of the brain that would be predicted by acupuncture theory, despite no known anatomical pathways connecting the toe to those brain areas. And there's a special camera that has uh, been used to register uh, biophotons in the 200 to 800 nanometer light spectrum. That's from ultraviolet to near infrared, these photons that have been used. And it shows that uh, when stimulated, the meridians generate light along the channels that were, are identified uh, and identical to the descriptions uh, found in ancient traditional Chinese medicine textbooks with respect to meridians. So light energy and what we could learn uh, when we use light not only to screen but also to treat is so powerful. And today we'll see how we're using sound and light to treat uh, different aspects of uh, our patients with chronic disease. So here we know that dental toxins and pathogens uh, affect the meridians, and then that has a physiological, emotional, and uh, psychological uh, effect. Of course, the oral microenvironment, because in oncology, we're now talking about the tumor as an organ. It has the mass, or the tumor, or the nodule. It has the blood supply, the vascular network, and it has the lymphatic flow. But what about the matrix? So the matrix, the extracellular fluid, the ground regulating system, along with the blood supply, the lymphatic, and the mass is the organ that now, in oncology, we're describing it as such, not just treating the tumor, but treating that organ or that tumor microenvironment. So with respect to the mouth, the oral environment, of course, we want a healthy microbial environment, and this is a portal for sustaining nutrition. On the opposite end of that, we have a potential reservoir for predominantly pathogenic microbes. And of course, that leads to a portal for destructive toxins, not only locally, as we mentioned, but systemically. And the oral environment can and does play a direct and an indirect role in the incidence and progression of cancer and other chronic disease and must be considered as part of an integrative therapy uh, approach. So we know the cancer is an epidemic now. In the U.S., one of every two men will have cancer sometime in their lifetime, and one of, in every three females. Of course, that doesn't include anyone in this room, right? That's like outside of this room. 
And so we have to be proactive and we have to change these statistics. And remember, cancer is not a genetic disease. Because my father had prostate cancer, that doesn't mean that I'm doomed to have prostate cancer. We have to work on the epigenetic factors. What is it that turns those genes on? And you've heard a lot of that uh, this weekend already. So it's, it's thought or predicted that by, by the year 2030, every human will have cancer sometime in their lifetime. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. Now we're seeing younger patients with cancer. Uh, we have a 16-year-old patient with uh, ovarian cancer. We have a 22-year-old with colon cancer. Young ladies with breast cancer. When I started this, breast cancer, average age, 60 years. Now the average age is in the low 30s, right? So we have to be proactive. What is the big challenge in oncology? Uh, and it's not the primary tumor, it's the metastasis. Because with rare exceptions, most patients with cancer succumb to the disease because of the metastasis, to the liver, to the brain, to the lungs, or to the bone. They don't die from the breast cancer, from the colon cancer, from the prostate cancer. They die from the metastasis. And 80 plus percent of the money that is spent in oncology research is spent in studying the primary tumor, not the metastatic activity. So there has to be a paradigm shift in money being spent on studying how does a tumor or cancer cells from one site go to another site. One thing that I want to point out with respect to pathogens, which is very important in the dental world, in oncology, is that now um, I just came back from an intensive four days course at Harvard, and one of the things that they're finding out is that how does a breast cancer cell survive in the lung or the liver? Did you ever wonder that? Right? How can a breast cancer survive cells, survive in the liver. Then they do a biopsy of the liver, and they say, this is the breast cancer. This came from the breast. Well, what now they're finding is that that breast cancer cell, when it migrates to the liver or to the lung, guess what? It's taking along microbes with it. It's taking pathogens, bacteria, fungus, parasites possibly. So what it's doing is it's setting up shop in a distant organ but changing that microenvironment so that it can survive in that foreign tissue. So cancer, and we'll see later, is definitely an intelligent process. Here we see the five-year relative survival for all cancer sites by stage, and this is the National Cancer Institute SEER data. That's the surveillance, epidemiology, and end-stage result data. And we see that as cancer metastasizes, the five-year survival decreases significantly to 26.2% in metastatic uh, activity. So here it is, even year one, year two, year three, year four, five of metastasis, the survival decreases. What's important to know here is look at the four-year survival, 28.7%, and keep that in mind because I'm going to show you something in a bit. But what we do here, what you do, what we do uh, as integrative physician is we look at this disease from a dysfunctional perspective with a wide angle. And to do that effectively, we have to look at all aspects of disease and wellness. Because remember, anti-aging is anti-cancer. And disease is lack of wellness. So we have to look at this parameter. We need to look under, under underlying cause, not just have a Band-Aid approach. And as holistic, natural healers, we have to have a bias towards non-toxic, natural, anti-cancer therapies. 
although we're medical doctors and sometimes we do have to avail to surgery, we do have to do a low-dose chemotherapy that's called IPT. Anyone heard of IPT, right? Insulin potentiation therapy. So the way it works is that cancer cells have much, much greater insulin receptors on their cell membrane than normal cells. And they have much greater IGF-1 receptors, insulin growth factor 1 and 2 receptors. So when we give insulin IV, of course, the blood sugar lowers and these receptors open up. And now, instead of giving full-blown chemo, we could give 30%, 25% of the conventional dose of chemo, have the same or better results with much, much less toxicity. And sometimes we have to do that because a patient comes to the clinic with a tumor the size of a grapefruit on their neck from a squamous cell carcinoma, it's blocking circulation to the brain, we have to do an integrative approach, right? Or they have a breast tumor that, to, I kid you not, the size of a melon, right? Ulcerated and all that. So we need to affect that anti-tumor uh, situation much quicker. But always in an integrative approach. And then we have to critically evaluate our results. Dr. Tony, how are you doing? How, you know, what are your stats? But we're clinicians. We're not trained to, you know, do stats, and that takes a whole team. But fortunately, we have done that lately, and we'll see some of our uh, work in this area. So how can we improve? What do we need to change? Because every day, cancer is tougher. When I started uh, in this field o over 25, almost 30 years ago, it was B17, Laetrile, coffee enemas, some vitamin C, and nutrition. And many patients got better. Now you have to do a lot more because people are just more toxic. The world is toxic. And we have to realize that what we do is truly science-based. Although I made Quack Watch, and when I looked at the internet the other day, I saw that the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine is also on the Quack Watch list, right? So we are doing good things because when we make it to Quack Watch, that's good, right? But we are science-based. This is science-based of what you do, what we do in uh, clinical oncological work. And then very importantly, that's often missing, at least in the medical world, is that partnering with our patients, right? Now you go to the doctor. By the time the doctor comes in, you're already on the gurney. Your vitals have been checked. He comes in for a minute or five minutes if you're lucky and then leaves. So he didn't see, he or she didn't see how you walked in. Did you have any signs of pain? How was your gait? Things that they teach us in, you know, first day of medical school. That's lost. By the way, I went to a primary care doctor in San Diego where I live just to, I said, well, I might as well use my insurance. I've never used it. So I wanted a cardiac workup. And the internal medicine doctor, the primary, he says, do you have any chest pain? And I said, no, I don't have chest pain. He says, well, I can not order a cardiac workup then. Imagine that. You have to like go in there having a heart attack or something for him to have a cardiac workup. It's, it's crazy what's happening, right? So uh, integrative medicine is composed of the, all these factors, and I think this applies to dentistry, of course, as well as it does to, to medicine. And the next slide shows us the four-year relative survival for metastatic cancer at Hope for Cancer Treatment Centers and according to the um, SEER data. So we are uh, undergoing a, a five-year retrospective study, and right now we have completed the data for four years, from 2015 to 2018, and for breast cancer in the blue is the results at Hope for Cancer, this is the N number, and this is the result uh, for the NCI data. And this is stage four cancer patients. 92% of the patients we see are stage four. I'm sure that a lot of the patients you see have gone to other dentists and horror stories that come to you, right? So, for example, in breast cancer, 
uh, of 166 patients that we have uh, tracked for four years, uh, we are at 62% for your survival compared to 31.6. You see lung cancer, 42 patients, 52.3% versus 5.4. Colorectal cancer, 57 patients. They're not huge numbers, but for what we do in tracking these many patients, it's a lot of work, right? Uh, it reminds me of the story of um, there was a, a storm in the UK, and after the storm, this little boy went to the beach, and he wanted to see what had happened, and there were a lot of shellfish on, washed on the shore. So he bends down, picks one up, a uh, starfish, I'm sorry, a starfish, picks it up, puts it in the water, walks back, picks another one up, and puts him in the water. But at a distance, there was an older man, and he looks at the little boy, walks up to him, and he says, son, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. You can't save all of these starfish. And the little boy looked up. He thought for a second. He bent down, picked one up, put him in the water. And what did he say? That's one more that I helped. And that's what we are doing every day in our office, right? We can't have 100% but these are really good numbers. Look at pancreatic cancer, uh, 35 patients, four-year survival, 42.9% versus 2.5%. And prostate is 35.5%. SEER data, it, I don't know what happened here, 35.5%, and we are at 72 plus uh, percent. So this is what we could all do. And part of this success is the work that you do, because all of our patients see a biological dentist or a conscious dent dentist, if we want to call him or her that, right? So cancer is intelligent. Who here knows someone with cancer, right? Who here has had cancer? Okay. So maybe some of you ask the doctor, hey, doc, why did I get this? tumor. And I've heard patients tell me that the oncologist told them it was bad luck. <laughs> God gave it to you. That's the worst one, right? Or you must have done something to deserve it. Or it's in your cards. <laughs> and truly, cancer is intelligent. And let's look at the 10 hallmarks of cancer. This is published since the year 2000, and then in 2011 by Hanahan and Weinberg. Dr. Robert Weinberg, a friend of mine from MIT, has uh, one of the ones that have done a lot of this work. And these hallmarks or characteristics of cancer are inherent to all cancer types. So it doesn't matter if it's prostate, breast, colon, pancreatic, brain tumors. So when we're treating cancer, we're not treating a cancer type. We're treating the mechanisms, the hallmark, the characteristics of cancer. That's important to understand because a lot of patients call us and they say, Dr. Tony, have you treated fibrosarcoma or uh, myo, you know, these rare cancers? Uh, we have a patient in Cancun now, 16 years old, who has uh, testicular mesothelioma. I've never heard of that. In 30 years, I've never seen one. Right? So we're not treating the testicular mesothelioma. We're treating the hallmarks, the characteristics of cancer. What treats the cancer type is chemotherapy because they're going at those specific receptors, right? So one of the first hallmarks of cancer is that cancer cells can bypass uh, the growth suppressor signals of the body. So it's independent of that. And also, it generates its own uncontrolled growth signals. So it has a mind of intelligence of its own. Thirdly, cancer cells demonstrate social intelligence. They learn from each other. This is one of the things why the first rounds of chemo usually do better, have better results than subsequent rounds. So when someone, especially when, oh, we're starting a clinical trial, you know that's going to be a failure. I haven't seen a clinical trial now that has given us uh, success or given the conventional community success. 
cancer cells learn how to uh, preserve their life, how to exist. They figure it out. One of the ways is by altering its own genes. They have different antigenic shift and antigenic drift. And so they learn how to bypass recognition by the immune system. So even though you might have a good lymphocyte neutrophil ratio or you know, your white blood cells are okay, is the immune system able to see those cancer cells? Because cancer cells can cloak or shield themselves from immune recognition. And three of the major cells, immune cells that are very important, not only in cancer, but in microbial uh, health, is dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are the cells that go into uh, T lymphocytes, and then they go into the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Very, very important cells in our body, dendritic cells. Macrophages. Macrophages are like policemen in the police station. When the, fire, when the alarm or the call comes in, the macrophages go to the site of where they're needed. So macrophages are on call all the time. What cancer cells do is they suppress macrophage activation. They keep the macrophages in the police station. Every tissue in our body has macrophages. And so immunotherapies that can activate and promote macrophage activity is very, very necessary in cancer therapy and in your therapy because you're dealing with a lot of uh, pathogenic uh, events in, in, the, in the mouth. And then thirdly is the natural killer cells, very, very important in uh, suppressing the release of key cytokines. Yes? The previous slide? Well, at the end, you'll have all 10 of them in one slide, so you don't have to take pictures of each. Yeah. So um, also, we look at cancer uh, affecting the adaptive immune system, and then next you'll see the innate immune system. The difference is the innate immune system is the quick acting. Someone sneezes, someone coughs, and our innate immune system is taking care of that micro. Our adaptive immune system that you see here is uh, more of the uh, strong immune cells, the T helper, the T suppressor cells, and that has to do a lot with inf inflammatory uh, pathways and up and down regulation of these uh, uh, important T cells. Any of you heard of cancer stem cells? Yes. Well, cancer stem cells, here's the story. A tumor, one cubic centimeter of a tumor, let's say a tumor that measures one by one centimeter, that's a cubic centimeter. That tumor has at least one billion cancer cells, billion with a B. 65% of those cells are active at any one time. 35% are dormant at any one time. So 1% are called cancer stem cells. 1% of those billion cells are called cancer stem cells. That's about a million cells. So when someone has a mammogram, who does mammography here of the females? Good, you should not do that <laughs> because it increases the risk of breast cancer and it's not an opportune diagnosis. Once a mammogram detects a tumor, there's already millions and billions of cancer cells in that one tumor. And remember, cancer is seldom a local disease. It's a systemic dysregulation. So cancer stem cells account for 1% of all the cells in a tumor. But these are the ones that are resistant to chemo and radiation. And these are the ones that metastasize. 99% of them are called non-cancer stem cells. Those are the ones that can be killed by chemo and radiation. And they cannot survive in the bloodstream. 
But these guys are really the bad guys, the cancer stem cells. The next uh, key principle or hallmark of cancer is that cancer cells are able to recruit healthy neighboring cells. And look at this out of the University of Iowa. This is a cancer cell and this is a normal cell. So what they found, this was published in 2015 in the American Journal of Cancer Research, they found that cancer cells uh, release like a lasso, a rope, and they're recruiting neighboring healthy cells to increase tumor mass. And you'll see that here. So you see that cancer cell recruiting a healthy neighboring cell, now there's growth of that tumor. This is not by accident. It's a well-orchestrated process. The eighth hallmark of cancer is that cancer cells create their own nutritional blood supply. So one of the things that has to be done when someone has a breast lump or a tumor that's visible with an ultrasound is to look at blood flow, vascularity. Increased blood supply, more likely that that's a malignancy. And in treatment, we look at vascularity as treatment is proceeding because we want to decrease blood supply as one of the hallmarks of cancer. The ninth key principle is that cancer cells resist apoptosis, meaning they don't have birth control, right? They'll continue to divide freely. There's nothing that will cause them to apoptose. And number 10, we all know which one that is, and that's inflammation. And as we look at the next slide, we know, we'll go back, uh, there's one more slide. Uh, <laughs> so inflammatory triggers microbial infections. Big, big deal here. Autoimmunity, fibrosis, immune deregulation, and inflammation by chemicals, tobacco, alcohol, nutrition, you know, lack of poor nutrition, pollution, GMOs, that leads to eventually tumor development. And there you have impaired apoptosis, you have all those characteristics, hallmarks that I mentioned. When this continues, then we have, oops, sorry, this is, uh, then we have uh, overt growth, of cancer, oh, sorry, this is, uh, see, I'm a Colombian, American, Mexican, so these things are kind of a little confusing, but here we have the metastasis, right? When we have sustained inflammation after tumor growth, then we have high risk of metastatic activity with all the features and more that we have just seen including genomic instability. So we have to mitigate inflammation. It's not suppressing inflammation, but we have to mitigate it. And then this is the slide that I promised that has all 10 of the characteristics or hallmarks of cancer with the reference on the bottom. So as we move forward, is it an all, isn't it all about the cancer terrain, right? We talked about the tumor microenvironment. So it's about the terrain. Cancer forms because of the terrain. And earlier today, we heard a great presentation on pH, on voltage, on lower metabolism. That's the key in what's changing this terrain to allow cancer to form. And uh, here I put some of those uh, important terrain disrupting uh, areas that have to be address the soul and the spirit and separation from God, in my experience, is the biggest reason why cancer patients don't heal. And my second book that's coming out next March is about emotions and cancer. So please, please, when you see a cancer patient, if you're not trained in helping them emotionally, send them, refer them to someone who could work on the emotional and the spiritual because then they'll love you more for it. What you do will be magnified and what we do will be much better 
when we address this area. So, the next slide. It's about the seven key principles. If, oh, see, it just jumped a lot. And I promise I only pressed it once. So, this, the slide before that, I can't get it to work. Oh, no. Next one. Next one. El próximo. <laughs> you know, they gave me an hour and a half, so I guess I have a little bit of time to do this. And if there's any questions, okay, let, let me uh, switch. Let me go to the next one. Oh, no, we're here. So if you forget anything or everything that I said, please remember this previous slide which has the seven key, oh, this is, uh, see, this is the forces to be, right? They don't want this information to come out very <laughs> clearly and easily. So, so here, the seven key principles, if you forget anything that I said this weekend or that you heard, please remember these seven key principles. Six of these principles apply to all of us in the room. They are non-toxic cancer therapy, that's the one specific for patients with cancer, and the other six, full-spectrum nutrition, immunomodulation, detoxification. With detoxification, remember, we start with detoxing the thoughts. A negative thought can kill you faster than a bad germ. So we have to detoxify the thoughts, oxygenation, Restoring the microbiome, spiritual and emotional healing. And I'll go through them one by one as uh, quickly as I can so we could get to uh, the dental information. Uh, so maybe I should just click over here. I apologize, but truly this is um, conspiring. Ty talked about conspiracy, right? You know what, Del Bigtree is going to give a great lecture at the end of the day, today, after me. And uh, I'm actually moving from California to Texas next month because beginning January 1st in California, mandatory vaccinations kick in. And uh, I'm not going to vaccinate my children nor my grandchildren. And so we have to do what we have to do, right? And sometimes these decisions are not easy, but uh, we have to stand for what we preach and what we say. So the seven key principles were uh, published in a peer-reviewed journal back in 2012 on the Forum of Immunopathological Diseases and Therapeutics out of UCLA. One of the most uh, successful therapies that we have worked on for almost 20 years is using sound and light to affect cancer cells. And you, I know, use photodynamic therapy. Some of you do in your treatments. So sono and photodynamic therapy has cytotoxic effects. It modulates both the adaptive and the innate immune system. It also disrupts tumor angiogenesis, so very important for that characteristic of cancer, and Dr. Don Burke out of Harvard, before he passed away, was working on the uh, antimicrobial benefits of photodynamic therapy. Very, very important. Sorry, so photodynamic therapy works in, uh, in the following way. The patient takes a photosensitizer uh, sublingually, topically, intravenously into the tumor or interstitial and then we wait a certain amount of time for that um, sensitizer to be uptaken by the tumor and then we start the activation with the light. So this is an inert substance, usually comes out of chlorophyll uh, or algae and it's selective uh, for cancer cells. Then we use the sound and the light to activate that sensitizer, and we get uh, cytotoxic effects. 
With respect to dentistry, in, um, there was a publication that was in 2014 in the Journal of Periodontology, and it talked about antimicrobial photodynamic therapy as an adju adjunct to non-surgical treatment of aggressive periodontitis, a split mouth randomized control trial. So what they did, as you see here, they, they split the, the mouth, they do the scaling, this is scaling, and root planning on the right, and then they do the same plus antimicrobial photodynamic therapy. And the way they did it is they had the test group, the control group, four sessions of antimicrobial photodynamic therapy on days 7, 9, 14, and 21. They used uh, uh, a thiazide chloride um, 10 milligram per milliliter sensitizer. They used red light at 670 nanometers. And let's see what the results were. Should I press up or down on this? Uh, down. Down, okay. So here we go. In deep periodontal pocket, uh, they said they showed that in the test group, they had a significant decrease in the, um, in the PD and a gain in clinical attachment at 90 days, where you see here's the control and here is the test group. And so from moderate all the way to deep. The test group also demonstrated significantly less periodontal pathogens and a lower ratio of those uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that improved, there was a clinical improvement, microbiological and immunological benefits by using antimicrobial PDT in conjunction with the SRP. And so there was, a, this is sort of like a meta-analysis review of different publications and they conducted a bacterial reduction, uh, studies that conducted on bacterial reduction after antimicrobial photodynamic therapy in root canals. And it's hard to see, but there's so many different types of microorganisms there. The gist of it is that this lowered the pathogenic load uh, in these root canals significantly using photodynamic therapy. Switching a little bit to hyperthermia because you know that cancer cells are heat sensitive. Human normal cells are heat resistant. So this is why when we have a fever, it doesn't kill normal cells, it kills the bugs. So a fever, an inducing fever in cancer patients is important and that's what we call hyperthermia, okay? It also suppresses angiogenesis and so at Hope for Cancer, we do local hyperthermia and we do systemic hyperthermia. It's like a key part of any, should be of any uh, cancer therapy. And how does hyperthermia affect the immune system? This is important because hyperthermia helps the cells be recognized, the cancer cells be recognized by the natural killer cells and by the T lymphocytes. Also, hyperthermia induces the release of heat shock protein. Heat shock protein is important to activate T cells, natural killer cells as well. And this is interesting. Oh, sorry. Uh, it helps uh, uh, induces the release of exosomes. Remember, exosomes are like the new kid in the block. They're signaling molecules. And when you have that sig signaling happen, there's better communication. So the immune system is going to be more effective. Uh, everything is going to work better. The voltage, the pH, once you have those signaling uh, communication pathways. And then also here, you see that there's a direct immune activation just by heating up the body. Okay. And uh, hyperthermia improves the ability of the immune system uh, to get to the tumor areas as well. Intravenous cancer therapies. Uh, I am the uh, international consultant uh, for a company out of Germany, and we've been blessed to be able to have things like Boswellia, frankincense, that now we could do intravenously not only topically or by nebulization, we could do it intravenously. 
uh, sugar oil. This is ginger. Very effective for triple negative breast cancers. That's one of the most challenging types of breast cancer. When they're estrogen negative, progesterone negative, and HER2 negative. There's a called triple negative breast cancer, very aggressive. And with shaga oil, ginger extract, and EGCG, which is green tea extract, we can affect those triple negative uh, breast cancer cells. Vitamin C, you know, this onifolia is a um, olive water extract, uh, very good for general health and wellness, helps cell membrane activity. We could give that uh, intravenously as well. Whereas Veritrol, all these were able to provide intravenously. Hyperacin is interesting because that's from St. John's wort. So it's a St. John's wort extract. Given intravenously, how many of our patients are depressed, right? And it's uh, very effective for that. And hyper, uh, artesanate, wormwood, also part of our cancer, cancer protocol because we know that cancer has to do with microbes, right? Hilda Clark talked about parasites. Dr. Tullio uh, Simoncini in Italy talks about fungus, cancers of fungus, and others talk about bacteria, like Raymond Royal Rife, right, when he talked about the BX virus. So we're able to do a lot of diverse cancer therapies because cancer is a multifactorial disease, and we have to treat it in a multifactorial way. With respect to the immune system, we're going through those seven key principles. The next one is the immune system or immunotherapies. And, you know, we could talk days and days on this, but let me just briefly talk to you about two of them. Uh, uh, Dr. Nick mentioned Sunivera, so we'll talk a little bit about that, and we'll talk about the Salgina. Uh, but the Sunivera is basically to activate the macrophages. Remember that we talked about the policemen and the macrophages that are suppressed by cancer cells? Well, with the Sunivera, we're able to affect uh, phagocytosis by the macrophages. And this is what's happening here. The pseudopods that are released by the macrophages to gobble up cancer cells, viruses, and bacteria. The next protocol uh, is called Salgina. What I want to highlight is this part of it. It's called the Salvis immunotherapy program. And here we're using uh, three components. One is, one is given intravenously to upregulate the immune system. And that one is uh, taken from the spleen of the gray shark. Uh, the previous speaker talked about the shark fin. Well, sharks have quite interesting features uh, with respect to immunology and uh, oncolytic effects. And this is one. We were able to uh, remove the white blood cells from the spleen of the gray shark, of the gray shark. It's a patented technology. It's approved by Mexico. We have, um, this, these sharks are in abundance, so that's not a problem with extinction or anything like that. And uh, we're able then to give this uh, intravenously. It preps the immune system. And then we give something called Harry protein intramuscularly. And what Harry protein does is it disrupts that cell membrane. We heard about the cell membrane and how important the cell membrane is. In cancer as well, it protects those cancer cells. So with the Harry protein, we could do that also with uh, exosomes because we get that signaling there but it exposes the antigens in the cell membrane, so now the immune system and other therapies like vitamin C, B17, hyperthermia, pulsating electromagnetic field therapy, any of that can have much better results. And then we combine uh, from Cuba uh, the blue scorpion venom. If you uh, go to PubMed or Google Scholar, you'll see a lot of publications on the effect of blue scorpion venom in cancer, also in malaria. Okay. So very effective immunotherapy uh, program. And um, a quick visual on the mechanism is that cancer cells deceive and paralyze those dendritic cells that we talked about earlier. And that's part of immune ev evasion. 
And so now the T cells, the T lymphocytes, cannot be activated. So what this does, the TCM from the white blood cells of the gray shark, is that we're able to stimulate, activate these dendritic cells to transfer the antigenic information to the T lymphocytes. So now we're having immune activation. The beauty about this is that it's just stimulating your God-given immune system to do what it's supposed to do. We're not really putting anything exogenous, right? Like some clinics that do dendritic cell therapy, they're not as effective as stimulating your own dendritic cell uh, activity. Okay? So the next key principle is nutrition. You guys know a lot about nutrition. So the main thing is to avoid cancer triggers, cancer promoters, immune distractors, and treatment antagonists. One of them is caffeine. We only serve coffee through enemas at our treatment centers. They're not able to you know, drink coffee. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and everything else that you know. And these patients are already on sympathetic overload. So uh, coffee, enemas without cream or sugar, one, <laughs> one a day. Uh, the Gerson therapy did five to six coffee enemas a day. We don't do that many because we're doing a combination of different therapies. So sometimes, you know, you get these macho uh, patients from Nashville that come in with their cowboy hats and their boots, and they say nothing is going down that way, right? They don't want to do the coffee in them. And we encourage them. We get a beautiful nurse to help them do the first couple <laughs> ones. And then after that, they want... they you feel so much better. Remember, coffee enema is not to cleanse the colon. Coffee enema is to purge the liver and the gallbladder. Okay? It's different than a colonic, a hydrocolon therapy. So uh, we could do coffee enemas even at our home. And like you, I'm a doctor that will not give a patient something that I wouldn't do myself. And I've done a lot of these therapies myself. I continue to do them. I don't do coffee enemas as much as I would want to, but uh, that's uh, very helpful for detoxing. The biggest organ of detoxification, that's the liver. By the way, all these charts are in my book that's outside that you could purchase if you wish. And um, different ways to detox because we're at a dental conference and I won't talk much about this because you know that, but this is, I spend a lot of time talking about this area when I lecture at medical conferences, of course, because they don't focus on, on the dental detox, right? But uh, coffee enemas, juicing, near-infrared sauna, lymphatic massage, and so forth. Oxygenation is the other key principle. You know the reasons for why oxygen is so important. Hyperbaric oxygen chamber, ozone in all its modalities. We have a cold plasma ozone generator where we could treat topically with ozone. Uh, those treatments can be 15 to 20 minutes long on a lymph node and on a breast area, a tumor in the neck. So there's a lot that we could do with ozone. The next key principle is restoration of a microbiome. And look at all the categories of where we can go and do so much good for the patient by helping their microbiome. The immune system, metabolism, absorption of nutrients, uh, regulating obesity, anti-inflammatory effects, and of course, the deficient microbiome is not just about cancer, but autism, anxiety, depression, diabetes, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and always remember, it's not only about the internal microbiome, but it's about the external microbiome. I don't know about you, but in this room and in this hotel, any hotels, we're like dragging. I hope I have enough energy, you know, uh, <laughs> keep you awake after lunch. I lectured in uh, Atlanta not too long ago, and there were, there were, what, 250 ladies because there was a breast cancer conference, and I was the only man in the room. And I said, I hope my testosterone is enough <laughs> with all the estrogen in the room, right? 
So um, it's important to work on our external microbiome as it is to our internal microbiome. And then last but not least of the seven key principles is the emotional and the spiritual, which should be the first one. We've developed what we call the BEST program, where we look at the behavioral, emotional, and spiritual aspects of health. And that's what the BEST program is. And you know this, it's bringing from what's under the water, the iceberg principle, to the visible. 90% of our traumas are not visible. Someone said, bury feelings, never die. Let me tell you a story. We had a patient, 63 years old, Phyllis from San Diego. She was a school teacher, and she had a right breast cancer. And we had been working on her for a year, two years, three years, and she was okay. She was working full time, but that tumor was still there. And no matter what we did, that tumor was still there, and it kind of bugged me. Uh, and so I started to learn about the connection with the emotional and the breast. And what I found out is that she was sexually abused when she was 10 years old. And she's 62 now, so for 52 years, her father sexually abused her, her grandfather, and her uncle. So they knew, she knew, and now I was the first person to know. 50 years later, and I helped her let go, right? Let go of the sudden traumatic shock experience that she was not ready for, nor did she have a solution for at the time that it occurred. And we all have a bag of stuff. So if I could give you a pearl, no matter if you're 80 or 20, if I could give you a pearl to take home is work on your emotional stuff. I've been working on my stuff for five years, and every so often I recall another trauma, another conflict. I still believe that the college basketball coach at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, where I grew up, who was P.J. Carlissimo, for any of you that know basketball, he was the reason why I didn't become an NBA basketball player. I'm believing my own lie. It's that Colombians can't, lie, can't jump, right? It had nothing to do with the coach. But you fabricate your own thoughts and lies, and that becomes a trauma, right? So, so I go by the basketball court, and you know, I pick up a ball, and I shoot it, and then I trigger back to when I was in college. Oh, he didn't give me the chance, right? So we have to work on that. And I, I promise that your incidence of chronic disease or the progression of any chronic disease that you may have now will significantly decrease. And I could stand up here for two hours and tell you story after story after story of how our stage four cancer patients have reversed their illness working on this. Of course, they're doing the vitamin C and the, all these other things, but I truly know I don't believe, I know, I know that this is the reason why they healed. And so why not? We're all doing great things. We're needed. We have to help each other. Joe Marcola, Dr. Marcola once told me, he said, Tony, we have to take care of each other. You know, we're one tribe bringing this information and this education and this uh, knowledge to the world. And so let's help each other, right? Let's get rid of the stuff that every day is affecting our immune system. Buried feelings never die. So those are the seven key principles. And in oral or dental health, uh, let's look at these seven key principles in the content of oral and dental health. So it's like uh, finding a leak. You first fix the leak. The main leaks that draw from the effectiveness of therapies and feed the growth of chronic diseases such as cancer, you see it there, dentals, heavy metals, emotions, scars, thyroid. 70% of our patients, including men, have thyroid dysfunction. 
we're seeing that every day in our, when we do functional thermographies. Thyroid is a big issue. And remember the PNA, the psychoneuroendocrine immune system. If that endocrine immune system is dysfunctional or deficient, then the immune system is going to suffer everything because we're a unified whole, right? So please refer or figure out how to... Uh, anyone has thermography in, in their office, a couple of you? I'm not sure if that's, you know, something dentists can do legally, but it's a great tool. Uh, the one I use is called Alpha Thermodiagnostic. It also has a um, dental uh, section. And I know Dr. Mar Margolis, a uh, friend of mine for many years, I don't know if he still does it, he probably does, but he never saw a patient in his dental office without having a thermography done. Because you see the dental and you see the association from a functional perspective of uh, the whole body, including the thyroid. Uh, dietary imbalances, uh, toxins, uh, dirty electricity, that's a big one, right? 5Gs and all the things that are happening now. And Dr. Tom Levy, a good friend of mine, uh, he was one of the first doctors that I invited to my clinic in Tijuana back in the year 2000 when we started Hope for Cancer in Tijuana. Uh, excellent book, Hidden uh, Epidemic, as you know. Uh, he says that uh, infected teeth, gums, tonsils, cavitations, and sinuses are linked to chronic degenerative diseases, and there's a whole list of them. So, we look here at the oral health problems with chronic disease and their implications. We have increased oxidative stress, infected dental implants, cavitational osteonecrosis, infected sinuses, infected tonsils, tooth infections and root canals, and chronic um, apical periodontitis. So, periodontitis and it's linked to cancer and other chronic diseases. I guess now people are waking up because we're talking about the dental, right? <laughs> so let's see how this goes. Chronic periodontal disease, CAP prevalence. 33% of adults have an asymptomatic or painless dental infection that may only be detectable by train, uh, by train evaluation and CD, uh, 3D cone beam imaging. Smoking risk. A study of the Spanish adults showed that CAP was present in 74% of smokers and 41% in non-smokers. Root canal connections. A study of Manhattan elderly reported 38% cap in people with root canal treated teeth as opposed to 5.1% in untreated patients published in 2008. Periodontal disease, statistical risk of some associated diseases and conditions. Diabetes uh, in, uh, increases the risk of uh, diabetes. You know, the, the issue with uh, antibiotics now, as you know, is uh, a big problem. And when someone has a round of antibiotics, you're really affecting the gut microbiome for at least six months to a year. And so think very, very carefully when you give antibiotics. Start off with something natural, right? If you're able to do IVs, do IV, colloidal silver, you guys know a lot of things, but try to diminish the, the use of antibiotics. Cardiovascular disease, a significant uh, greater risk uh, with um, periodontal disease, preterm birth also, respiratory disease. So here, I have some notes for this slide. It says, periodontitis pathways to diabetes. First, there is a subgingival microbial infection of the periodontium and pocket epithelium. Then, the periodontium is a gateway to the systemic circulation. The cell wall of the microorganism releases endotoxins like uh, uh, lipopolysaccharides, right? And this 
increases insulin resistance. So you're seeing how diabetes is developing in this pathway. Then the host response by releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-6 that interferes with lipid metabolism and insulin and the action of insulin. So basically what you're having is that when insulin is suppressed and the body becomes resistant to insulin, it results in hyperglycemia and that leads to pathogenic complications and then we call that diabetes. But it started with a subgingival microbial infection of the periodontium. Right? Isn't that pretty good for a medical doctor to say this stuff? <laughs> All right. So, periodontitis pathway to cardiovascular disease. A similar pathway, right, where we have periodontal infection, you have the bacterial byproducts that go into the, the bloodstream and then ultimately affects the blood vessels, microcirculation, you have invasion of these into the coronary vessels, and then we have cardiovascular disease. So when someone today was talking about microcirculation, that's really where it's at, right? Disease starts at the microvascular level, and then it goes to the uh, large vessels. Periodontitis and it's linked to cancer and other chronic diseases. So here, we'll go quickly through these slides. Uh, uh, Dr. Tom mentioned some of these earlier today, right, with uh, pancreatic cancer. So this study was, um, it was 51,000 plus male. They were health professionals, age 40 to 75. And the total incidence of pancreatic cancer in these uh, uh, subset of patients was 216. Uh, the conclusion was that periodontal disease is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer, and the risk increases by 58% uh, for those that smoke versus those that don't have a smoking history. So you're accumulating the different uh, factors that lead to pancreatic cancer here. The study shows 139,000 plus subjects, and uh, 75,000 uh, did not have periodontal disease, and this is from the National Health Insurance Research uh, Database in Taiwan, and uh, as explained here in the conclusion, is that positive association of PD with pancreatic cancer, more prevalent in males than females and more prevalent in those that are 65 or older. And the risk is independent of incidence of other chronic diseases or conditions. So very specific for pancreatic cancer in this huge study of uh, more than 139,000 patients. Breast cancer. Here we have a bacteria called Fusibacterium in the oral microbiome. Uh, which normally is part of the, of the normal flora, but can rarely become pathogenic and cause periodontal disease as well as other conditions. So here the study of the microbiome of the human breast tissue showed that uh, uh, the Fusobacterium uh, was enriched in malignant breast cancer tissue microbiome compared to that of normal breast uh, tissue. So definitely a correlation uh, with microbes and cancer. Right? So when we're uh, working with ozone therapy, where we're working with hyperthermia, with vitamin C, we're also getting antimicrobial benefits, right? So a lot of these treatments are giving us um, different benefits, a wide array of benefits. Here we look at the comparison of the microbiota adjacent to invasive cancer versus benign disease. And what we're seeing here is that where there is invasive cancer on this side versus the benign cancer, uh, you can't see this that well, but different types of uh, microbes affecting that microbiota is uh, more prevalent in the invasive cancer uh, area than it is in the benign breast tissue. Oh, sorry. 
uh, periodontitis and colon cancer. Again, our friend the Fusi bacterium are also connected to colon cancer, causing inflammation and carcinogenesis. The infection was shown to be prevalent in human colorectal carcinoma. Remember I said that at Harvard they saw that these uh, cancer cells are metastasizing and they're taking together the, uh, the microbes in that area? Well, you guys knew that from before, right? Because you're, you're seeing this in your dental uh, practice. So periodontitis uh, and oral cancer, we know that there's definitely a correlation with that. Correlation with presence of tumor is much larger than with presence uh, of a precancerous lesion. Oral squamous cell carcinoma, also profound uh, correlation with periodontitis and oral squamous cell carcinoma. So, you know, I, I've never understood why dentists don't refer patients to us because you guys are seeing a lot of this, I suppose, or some of this, right? But maybe you're referring them to someone in your neighborhood as opposed to Mexico because we get the stage four types of patients when these have metastasized. These types of uh, cancers, the squamous cell carcinoma, they metastasize preferentially to the liver and to the lungs, right? Very aggressive cancer. There was actually a gentleman here yesterday that said he came to um, talk to us here uh, because he has this problem and his has metastasized, metastasized outside of the oral cavity. So just a lot of different pathogens involved in squamous cell carcinoma. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, my hearing is, is not too good. So let's just quickly, tongue cancer, 5.23-fold 5. 5. increase when there's alveolar bone loss was found to be significantly correlated to the risk of tongue cancer uh, with the increase of 5.23-fold. Quite significant, right? This was a meta-analysis of studies that demonstrated significant correlation between periodontitis and lung cancer. Five cohort studies involving 321,000 participants were included in this meta-analysis, and the summary estimates based on the adjusted data show that periodontal disease was associated with a significant risk of uh, lung cancer. So in the U.S., uh, we have lung cancer, breast cancer and colon cancer in the female. And in the male, we have lung cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer, right, as the main types of cancer. So for sure, the lungs are up there, breast or prostate, and then colon. So a lot to do with hormones, nutrition, environmental toxins, and very important to know that those are the main three types of cancers in both men and females. Oxidative stress, oral health, and it's linked to cancer. We know what oxidative stress is, so we'll, um, toxins are the most uh, important part in, in many studies that, are, that is leading to oxidative stress, right? So here we see the progression from health all the way uh, through dysfunction, inf inflammation, and degenerative conditions. So we go from optimum health, we increase oxidative stress, inflammation increases, and then we get degeneration, and ultimately we have a, a cancer or chronic disease. And then on top of that, you put you know chemotherapy, <laughs> that is uh, disrupting uh, all the uh, anti-inflammatory pathways. The sources of oxidative stress are exogenous. These are the ones that uh, all of them we can control for the most part. But uh, what about endogenous? Endogenous um, are quite a bit, a lot to do with dental, as you see here. We've talked about uh, CAP, 
uh, well enough, uh, chronically infected sinuses, infected lymph nodes, and petrification. This is a big one. Uh, I would say 70% of our cancer patients have gut dysbiosis, gut petrification, or gut fermentation. So starting with uh, improving gut function is so, so important. And you're doing that in the work that you're doing, whether you, know, you realize it or not, right? <laughs> you're improving gut function. Root canals and cavitations, and they're linked to cancer. So here, the treatment of uh, root canal therapy is never completely sterile and is a fatally flawed procedure. I have a friend in Taiwan who did studies on, um, on animals, uh, on dogs, and he said, and this is something you know, his name is David uh, Lo in Taiwan, in Chiagi City, biological dentist, and he said from a human perspective and also his animal studies, there was never, ever, never, ever a healthy root canal tooth, right? So uh, here we see some of that. We have a normal tooth, free of infection, root canal treated, but no cap, moderate risk, then untreated root canal with cap, we have a great to severe risk, and then at the end we have a severe risk when we have a root canal uh, treated tooth with cap. The infective reservoir of root canals and cavitation, more than 25 million root canal procedures are performed every year in the U.S. Removal of the pulp and nerves makes future disease detection impossible until it manifests symptoms through local and systemic spread. Maybe it's not impossible if they get to you, right? <laughs> Becomes a source of chronic infections and that protects them from the immune system. And the pathogens gain entry into the venous and lymphatic system. When that happens, that's when, remember initially I said that these types of situation in the oral cavity are not local diseases, right? They don't stay local, they're systemic. And here we're seeing an example of that spreading through the lymphatic system and spreading through the venous system. With respect to cancer, cancer cells cannot metastasize through the lymphatic vessels. Cancer cells, uh, if they start in an organ, let's say the breast, they are called epithelial cancer stem cells. Those are the ones that metastasize. Remember I said that the cancer stem cells are the ones that metastasize. They're called epithelial cancer stem cells. For them to leave the primary tumor, they have to transition. They need to become mesenchymal cancer stem cells, so they take their vest off. And now they could leave the primary tumor, go through the matrix, go into the bloodstream, and then they're called circulating tumor cells. Those circulating tumor cells are mesenchymal circulating tumor cells. And then they could be floating in the bloodstream. That's when someone is in so-called remission. Have anyone heard, right? They get the chemo or whatever treatment and they say they're in remission. Now what do they do? It's watchful waiting. Waiting for what? For the tumor to be show up somewhere else, right? And in the meantime, they're doing PET scans every three to six months, which is about a thousand times more radiation than one chest X-ray and causing more mutations and causing uh, just a disarray of the immune system. And so those circulating tumor cells, they adhere to the wall of the blood vessel and then they put their vest back up. And then now they become again epithelial cancer stem cells. And now they go to the lung, to the liver, and they fix themselves there. So that's called epithelial mesenchymal transition, EMT. This is how metastasis happens, okay, through this transition phase. And uh, it could only happen through the venous system, not through the lymphatic. So when cancer cells end up in a lymph node, you might have, they might have cancer in the lymph nodes. 
But for that cancer cells to leave the lymph nodes, they have to go back into the venous circulation and then do what I told you. So, have you heard that someone with like lymphatic cancer or metastasis to the lymph node cannot have a lymphatic massage? You've heard that, but that's not true because cancer cells are not going to metastasize to the lymphatic system. So someone who has breast cancer, let's say, that has lymph node metastasis, they can have lymphatic massage. As a matter of fact, it's beneficial for them, right? Because you want to activate the lymphatic circulation. So I know it's getting late. Um, uh, Robert Jones studied 300 breast cancer patients over five years, and he found that 93% of women studied had root canals. 7% had other oral pathologies. So meaning <laughs> they all had something, right, in the mouth that causes tumors. In the majority of cases, occurred on the same side of the body as a root canal or the other oral pathology. And we see that in our work also when we do a full uh, thorough uh, interrogation of the patient, we all often see that the breast cancer is in the side of those root canal teeth. We see that every day, and I'm sure you have uh, seen the same. In our population? Yeah, I don't know that for a fact, but I think it's really high from what we see at our clinic. Uh, obviously, there's always something that spills, the drop that spills the, gla the, the glass, right, the water. So uh, I think that all these are factors, but there's something that turns that switch on, and that's what's hard to decipher in the work that we do. And I believe that it's, it, it's emotional, right? Because like the Angelina Jolies of the world, they have the BRCA gene positive, they have double mastectomies, they have a, a bilateral oophorectomy, and they think that's it. They're not gonna get cancer. Well, I have some friends in that industry that there are some signs that she has some cancer somewhere now. So it's not about removing, you can't cut cancer out, right? you have to fix the underlying dysfunctions or dysregulation. I don't like the word homeostasis either. I like the word dysregulation or dysfunction because we are never in homeostasis. We're never in balance. We're regulating, right? So we go out to the cold, our body has to regulate. So we're not really truly in homeostasis. Uh, I think that's an old term. So heavy metals in cancer, you know all this. I can make this uh, slides available for you. The different types of heavy metals have been seen and studied uh, here. Iron, nickel, chromium, mercury, uh, difference in, in tumor, breast tissue biopsies versus healthy biopsies. So, you know, it's never 100 percent, but very surely it's a contributing factor. These are other uh, metals, lead, zinc, copper, cadmium. You see the difference in tumor versus healthy tissue. Copper is an interesting one because uh, there's some, it's a gray zone in oncology, whether we should decrease or increase copper stores in the body. I'm not sure about that one yet, but here there is a greater amount of copper in healthy breast tissue than in tumor. What we also are surmising is that a lot of the breast cancer patients have asbestos in breast tissue. And hopefully within decades that will change because we're not exposed to asbestos as much as we were before. But, uh, but in our older female population, we're muscle testing and seeing a lot of uh, asbestos in, in tumor breast tissue. So, 
Maintaining uh, quality oral health is a big contribution towards the health of our microbiome. Oral microbiome and transmission of disease. In the middle there, you see that in health, the majority of the bacteria have a symbiotic relationship with the host. So the microorganisms are in green. The red with dotted outlines are potential cariogenic bacteria and periodontopathic um, bacteria and have been detected at healthy sites. So these here are not uh, uh, significant or relevant clinically. In disease, there is an increase in the number and the proportions of cariogenic bacteria and periodontopathic bacteria and possibly uh, this is especially true in gingivitis. So it's hard to read, but these are factors that may cause dysbiosis of the oral microbiome, smoking diet, oral hygiene, salivary flow rates, activity of salivary proteins, genetic differences, and other coexisting uh, chronic diseases, and antibiotics, a big one in this area. So it's important to recognize these potential um, uh, factors that are changing the oral microenvironment. So I think I only have a couple more minutes, so let me uh, go through these a bit faster. Integrative. You know, when, when Dr. Nick gave me an hour and a half, I said, wow, that's good. I could go through all my slides, but I just got the five-minute uh, uh, note here. So removal of dental toxin is a key step in integrative cancer therapies. Uh, Dr. Tom Levy was kind enough to write a endorsement for my book, and he wrote, hope should always remain, even in patients with the most advanced cases of cancer, many of whom, oh, that's, many of whom, I don't want to misquote him, so I have to, yeah. <laughs> many of whom have gone to hope for cancer. No, I'm not sure what it said, but... Uh, uh, where was that? And then dental infections are the primary cause of most cancers and are chronically neglected, resulting in relapses and secondary cancers down the road. So I thank Dr. Levy for um, endorsing my book. And I just want to finish with a short uh, video that I'll play here. Cancer, there are a few words we hear more. I'm not sure where the microphone is. In our lifetime. Many years ago as a young doctor, I personally felt the hopelessness of terminal cancer mm -hmm. as I walked beside my father in his own diagnosis and treatments. I wanted nothing more than to help him heal. So I began seeking a deeper understanding of cancer. I wanted to understand its causes and I wanted to find its cure. What I found was that our greatest hope of overcoming cancer was in combining the physical, mental, and emotional aspects of healing. Over the past 25 years, I've traveled the world researching and developing non-toxic treatments which optimize your immune system and ignite the healing process. Today, patients at Hope for Cancer Treatment Centers experience undeniable results. We see it every day in our patients' outcomes. They are living proof that there is hope for cancer. But we wanted to go further and reach more people. We wanted to take these truths beyond our walls and share them with the world. That's why I've written for cancer, seven principles to remove fear and empower your healing journey. This book is my life's work, and I invite you to discover how these seven principles form the foundation of our therapies and are restoring lives every day at our treatment centers. You will meet some of the thousands of patients we've guided through their journey, people who have experienced restored hope and healing. 
goes through these treatments, the very foundation of care at Hope for Cancer Treatment Center is that my father was healed and was able to live his remaining days free from cancer. Because of that experience, my approach to medicine was forever changed. I wrote this book for you to educate and empower you in your own healing journey to discover that there truly is hope for cancer. So in conclusion, I want to share with you that we all are changing the face of cancer. And I just want to thank you for this opportunity to present some of what I've learned in a long time. And please share it because only with people like us that are thinking outside the box can we really truly make a difference in this epidemic. And none of us want to be a statistic. So thank you so much and blessings. Thank you.